Good morning. Let's all stand. In the secret, in the quiet place, in the stillness, Father, we want to thank you again this morning for just another opportunity to begin to express, Father, in worship as we lift our voices to you, Father, uh, what is actually going on in our hearts. We are so thankful, Father. You know, Lord, we know that you rescued us. We know that you redeemed us, that you've forgiven us, that you saved us. Lord, we know that you've written our names in the book of life. In one of these days, Lord, you're coming back for us. All of this, Lord, comes to us because you are gracious and merciful, kind and forgiving. Uh, by no meritorious act of our own, you have redeemed us because you are merciful, Lord. And, and Lord, we just want to raise our hands and surrender again this morning. We want to open our hearts and express with our lips how much we love you, how much we appreciate you, how thankful, Lord, we are for you, Lord, and everything that you've done for us. So, Lord, as we now worship you, Father, and set aside this time to do that, we would ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work this morning in this congregation, in the lives of each person here this morning, and we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's kids that say, amen. amen. Let's remain standing. Our Father everlasting, the creating one, God. Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, 
And I had closed my eyes to see my King in majesty. Your grace compels my soul to love and draw in close. And I had lift my hands and sing, surrender everything in you. I know.
let's all stand.
my sin not in part, but the whole. Oh, we thank you for that this morning, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we stand here this morning cleansed, purified, and perfected in the blood of Jesus. We thank you this morning that your righteousness has been imputed to us to the degree and to the extent that we have become, we have been made the righteousness of God through faith. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you this morning that our names are written in a very special place. Oh, Lord, when you judge this world and you read our name there, that judgment will pass over us. We thank you for that. And now, Lord, we lift every need before you while we're still here. Uh, this is earth and not heaven, and we have struggles here, Lord. You told us in this life we're going to have difficulty, trials, tribulations. Uh, the Latin word is tribulum, and it's an instrument of... Uh, that just as goes over the soil to rip it up. And you told us we're going to have those times and those moments where those things are going to come. But Lord, you promise never to leave us, never to forsake us, when there doesn't seem to be a way to provide one, that you'd be an ever-present help in a time of need. And Lord, you've told us that we can cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. And so this morning, we lift before you our financial and our physical, our mental, our emotional, our spiritual, our marital, our family needs, Lord. We lift every one of these things, and I'm getting a good amen here this morning out of the mouth of babes, <laughs> sucklings. Lord, we lift these things to you, and we give them to you, and we're not going to take them back, Lord. And we do so in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's kids would say, amen. amen, amen. We'll spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle into your spot this morning. You guys can settle in your spots this morning. We'll get moving. All right, if you guys can settle in your spots this morning, we'll get moving. Okay. I'll just do this. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Aren't you glad that winter is finally here? Isn't it nice? I don't know if you guys noticed or not, but we, we have the new drainage system in in the front. But be careful because where we uh, had uh, 
you got the backhoe in here to dig, some of that doesn't have gravel back on it. So you could get stuck out in the back parking lot if you're not careful. So be careful not to drive on that as we finish up, and hopefully we can get that front paved before uh, uh, they shut down the batch plant down here. So be praying for that. Hey, shoebox gift. If you are involved in the shoebox giving of the gifts here uh, from Franklin Graham, please, uh, they're due today, right? Next week. The 19th. Make sure that you see Tamara or one of the cook girls, and they'll remind you of this. That's very important. Hey, secondly, in our lobby, we have, um, you'll see there's some free books there for you on every subject of false teaching entering the church. Have you seen that rotisserie? Those are free for you to take. Um, those are a gift from the church to you if you have any question about what's going on and some of the things, some of the false teaching that's entering in the church. Um, some of the people involved in discernment ministry have written little booklets on it so that you can get up to speed about it. So make sure that you take advantage of that. Also in that bookshelf, you'll notice there are some, some uh, paperback books. Those are also free for you to take um, to help you just discern some of the things that are going on today. But also, we want you to be sharing your faith. And there's a guy in our church, Don, Don Gracie, that came up with this. And I think it's a wonderful idea. And these are free. And if you want to donate something to them, there's a donation box beside them. But these are stickers that you put in your back window or on your bumper. I think the back window is a better place to put them because when people pull up behind you and, you know, you're stopped at a stoplight or a stop sign, and, and you know, and you got nothing better to do, they're reading these things. How many read bumper stickers when you... I, I do. And, uh, you know, some of them are kind of hilarious. Some not so much. I read one the other day that said, my wife's other car is a broom. I don't think that was too good. No, I didn't like that one. I mean, really, seriously? That's what you're going to say about your wife? And how come she hasn't peeled that off the back yet? I don't know. But these are better ones to put on. Maybe what we'll do is just cover those up, and they won't even know with some of these. But this is my favorite. There's a bunch of them out there. Please, if you want to give a donation, do so, but put them on your car. I like this one. It says, wake up and return to faith and trust in God. I like that one. So they're out there for you to do that. Um, don't forget that our Christmas uh, play is coming up quickly. It's going to be December the 16th. That's a Saturday night. And again, the 17th on Sunday. And it's a, a Charlie Brown Christmas special. Hey, got a little loud ring in here. Car Charlie Brown Christmas special. And I really am going to enjoy this one because my grandson, Evan, is Charlie Brown. He looks like Charlie Brown. We'll see how that goes. I understand he's learning his lines really well. And then lastly, don't forget, we're going to be having this year, we didn't last year, we had the year before, a family Christmas party here at the church, uh, December the, the 1st on a Friday at 5.30 p.m. You can pick this up out in the lobby and there'll be a potluck uh, and you can share a dish and then there'll be a gift exchange. So that's December the 1st and I think that's everything that I need to announce. Anyway, let's turn in our Bibles this morning again to the second chapter of Acts. And we've come as far as verse 41, and that's what we'll pick up this morning. Uh, I, I'm excited about this morning. Uh, one of my favorite sections of Scripture is found right here. In, uh, it, it, there's still a ring going on. Am I, am I ringing this morning? Is it just, can you hear a ring? Okay, it's just me. Don't worry about it. So, some mornings I wake up and I'm just ringing. Anybody have that problem? No, well, this is <laughs> so. Oh, just Randy. Okay. Brother, we'll talk afterwards. So, hey, let's, so let's turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 41, and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. You know, we're just coming to that section where we really understand the DNA of the church. Uh, the foundational truths that the church is to be about. And so, Lord, as we look at these five things this morning, I pray that we do not drift from them, that we don't become unmoored and un unanchored from them, Lord. It's the very thing that we see in the early church that brought your blessing. And, Lord, it also brought that effectiveness in the preaching of the gospel so lord as we look at these five things this morning and maybe not go over into chapter three but might look at a part of it just bless us this morning we pray 
In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And all God's kids would say, amen. You know, I've heard it said, and I don't know that I agree with it or not, but I've heard it said by pastors, as a matter of fact, that there's no place in the Bible, there's no place in the New Testament that gives us any insight or instruction on what our church services ought to look like. And I disagree with that because I think what is before us this morning truly is the foundation of the church. What the church should be involved in, what the church should look like, what the church uh, should have going on and cooking inside of its doors. So if you'll get your pan and pen out, if you're a note taker this morning, there are five things. Now, some have said four, but I see five in the next few verses, and I just want to read through that section, and then we'll come and take a look at those five things that were found in the early church. And I think these are the five things that the Holy Spirit wants to plant in the church even today. And you'll see those as we look through those, and I hope that you agree with them. Here we go. Um, Number one, it says here in, in verse 41, Then they gladly received his word and were baptized the same day, and God added to the church about 3,000 souls. So we know after the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, as Peter stands up with the 11, and he answers their question, what meaneth this? And then he gives the message of the gospel that 3,000 people respond to that message. They give their lives to Christ. They come to faith in the Lord. And here's what happens when you catch those fish. How many like to fish? What do you do with the fish when you catch them? You have to clean them. And so this is the cleansing process after you catch that fish. After evangelism is taking place, this is what the church is to be about. Five things. Let's take a look at that. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's number one. And in fellowship, that's number two. And in breaking of bread, that's number three. And in prayers, that's number four. And verse 43 says, and the fear, the fear of the Lord, the idea is, came upon every soul. Uh, That's number five. And because of that, many wonders and signs were done by the apostles And then we're going to see what the complexion of the church looked like in response to that. So five things this morning uh, we want to look at. Number one, doctrine. Now, it's been said uh, by churches even in our town that doctrine is divisive. You may have heard it on TV by TV evangelists or TV preachers that doctrine is divisive. And thus, we don't study doctrine in our church. Well, we study doctrine in this church because doctrine is not divisive. Unless it divides the sheep from the goats or the wheat from the tares or light from dark. But you can't even know how you are saved without doctrine. In fact, the Greek word there for doctrine is uh, didaskalia. You might want to write that down, didaskalia. And it simply means teaching and instruction. But the idea of that Greek word didaskalia is to report accurately and thoroughly what has been taught. So the first job, the foremost job, the paramount job of of the church is, is to report accurately what the apostles have taught. Uh, Let's take a look at 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 16 on into chapter 4, verse 5. Very important section of Scripture, and I know that here at Gold Country Calvary Chapel, you've heard it a lot, and you're going to hear it again this morning, because we're built upon a foundation, and it is a sure foundation, by the way, and we read it there in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to the end, verses 22, uh, that that foundation is the apostles and the prophets, Old Testament and New Testament. That's the foundation in which the church is built upon. And the church grows, and you and I are fitly framed together into this thing called the church because God has a purpose for the church, that the Holy Spirit should inhabit us, that he should empower us, that he should send us into this world to preach this gospel. And so we have a foundation, and the foundation is the Word of God. Thus, we draw our doctrine from the Word of God. 
We draw our theology, who God is, from the Word of God. And if you've not uh, gone through our doctrines class, I would advise you to do it. It's on our website. You can download the notes on the PDF form that's right there with it. We've gone through the history and authenticity of the Scripture so you know how you got this Bible and why you can trust it and why every one of the books uh, uh, that are canonized are found in our Bible, all 66 of them. So we studied the history and authenticity of the Scriptures. We've studied theology, the nature, the character of God. Who is He? What is He like? Then we studied Christology, who Christ is and what He is like. Then we studied the doctrine of the Holy Spirit so we had a greater understanding of the Trinity, of the God that we serve. We move from there to soteriology, which is the study of how you and I are saved. Very important. I went to a ecumenical pastoral lunch not too long ago, a few years ago. And I enjoyed the food. The food was great. The ladies really did a great job. And I enjoyed some of the fellowship, not all of it, because some of those uh, people, I guarantee you that um, we would not see eye to eye if we stopped and talked. I mean, there was every form and fashion of, of every religion and religious flavor represented there. But then we moved from the, the dining room into the sanctuary, and there was a worship team there, and they did a very good job of leading us into worship. But then the pastor that was hosting it stands... And he says, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as we walk in unity. Does that ring true to you? I bit a hole in my tongue. You see, the pastor's wife was one of my students in Bible college years ago. And I went to her afterwards and I said, I won't be coming back. I know that you asked me. In fact, she called me several times. Please come. I found out you're in town. You were one of my favorite instructors. I just wanted you to come and see what was going on in our church. I said, I won't be back. Because that statement is not only wrong, it's false. That is false teaching. That is from the pit of hell. Because you don't know how to be saved. You don't have a soteriology without doctrine. You don't have an ecclesiology, what the church is to be about without doctrine. You don't have an eschatology, where you're going without doctrine. Doctrine is that which has been taught and instructed. And the idea is that we continue to report it accurately and thoroughly that which has been handed down to us by the apostles. The apostles and prophets and the teaching of the Old Testament and New Testament is our foundation. That's why on Wednesday nights we're going through the Old Testament. That's why on Sunday mornings we go through the New Testament because we're laying a foundation underneath you in which you are fitly framed together. You're the building on this foundation so that the Holy Spirit will inhabit us. Now, here is what Paul tells Timothy. And here's the scene behind this. Paul is fading from the scene. He knows that his time of departure is at hand. He knows he's being poured out like a drink offering. He knows, no doubt, by the Holy Spirit that this time when he stands before Caesar, he's not going to be set free. He knows that in a very short period of time, he's going to be taken out, out there to the Appian Way because you couldn't crucify a Roman citizen, but you could behead them, and he would be beheaded for his faith. And so this is his last will and testament. He's giving to young Timothy, his left lieutenant in the faith, his young left lieutenant in the faith, he's giving him the final instructions of what are important. And so we read there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting there in verse 16, here Paul is reminding his student some very important things. All Scripture, please underline that. It doesn't mean some or most, but all Scripture. And that word for Scripture, you can write above it if you've got a space in your Bible. The Greek word there is graphi, graphi. Uh, you can but imagine uh, what that word translates to in our English language. Uh, we get as kind of a root uh, from this word uh, graffiti. It means written. What is written? It doesn't mean just that those men were inspired that wrote the Word of God, the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, but it means what they wrote was 
inspired. All graphy is given by the inspiration of God. It is God breathed. And if the God that we serve could speak out of nothing what we see is the known universe into existence to an act of his will and through his creative ability to speak and everything that we see came into existence. Don't you believe that he's powerful enough to make sure that what is written, all graphy, is God breathed? And listen, here's the application. And it is profitable for doctrine. We can form a dogma, we can form a confession, a manner of understanding of what God wants from us and who God is and our relationship with Him from what has been taught. All doctrine is profitable for us and it's profitable for this, for reproof. Have you ever been setting when the Bible is being taught and you're being reproved because your behavior doesn't line up with God's commandments? Have you ever been there? Just a few of you, right? Not all of us, but you've been there in that moment where you're being reproved or you're being corrected or you're being instructed in what? Righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's why in the early church, the apostles' doctrine was taught. We're going to see in a few moments daily from house to house in the temple, in in corporate and public settings, and yet in home Bible studies as well. Everywhere they went, the Bible was being taught. Old Testament, and they were forming the New Testament. And as the apostles would write those epistles, and they were circulated through the church, they were taught in the church. They were read in the church. And listen, and they were commanded to be followed by the church. And that's why Paul is saying to Timothy, as he's fading from the scene, all graphic, the whole written word, is inerrant, inspired, and authoritative, because it's God-breathed. And it is profitable for doctrine, for instruction, and for teaching. It's also profitable for reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness so that we might know how to live, that the man of God, now here's the deal, the man of God, the woman of God, the people of God, we love doctrine. We want to know what the Lord wants from us. We want to know how to be obedient to the Lord, amen? Thus we follow these things that the man of God may be perfectly and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And then he gives a charge to Timothy. I charge thee before God. It was as though Paul is bringing Timothy right into the very throne room of God. God seated on his throne and before God he is charging him with something. I charge thee before God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Three things Paul puts in that sentence. Number one, I'm charging you. This is a charge, and this is a commandment. It's it's similar to a military order. It's though the captain is giving an order uh, to a sergeant. Because one of these days, Jesus is going to return... One of these days, he is going to judge the living and the dead, and one of these days, he's going to set up his kingdom. In light of that, I am charging you, and this is what I charge you to do, Timothy. Preach the word. Proclaim it, teach it, instruct people. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. What does that mean? Well, some of you guys like to deer hunt, and you know that there's a season that you can hunt deer, and there's a season you're not supposed to hunt deer. I won't say you don't, but you're not supposed to. Right? What he's saying, there will be a time when people will want to hear the Word of God, and I think in the late 60s and early 70s during the Jesus movement, at the birth of Calvary Chapel, there was a whole counterculture that was flocking to that huge tent down there in Santa Ana, in Costa Mesa, and thousands upon thousands of young people were being saved. We wanted to hear the word. We longed to hear it. In fact, in those days, in that tent, with those propane heaters, you know, heating that tent, you would sit there as Pastor Chuck would instruct us. He would teach for two hours at a time, and it seemed like two minutes. The Holy Spirit was working. God was moving. 
hearts were opened and passionately desirous to hear what God had to say. And Chuck would just take a chapter and verse by verse would work through that. He would read it distinctly and then give to us the understanding of it. And we would go out and apply it and bring other people in. I never had the privilege of being down there. I had friends that were, but his nephew became my pastor as he was sent to Northern California to start the same work up here. But there was something about the Word of God. And as it was being taught, how it fed us, how we desired to know it and be obedient to it. And so he says, I'm charging you before God because there'll be a time when people want to hear it and there'll be a time when they don't want to hear it. And I think we're in that time where people don't want to hear it. Sadly to say. And we've seen as we've been warned in Scripture in the last days a rise of these churches that have departed from the biblical faith. Now they still have form, but they have no substance. They're not preaching the gospel. They're tickling people's ears. We're going to see that in a few moments because Paul warns us we'll be living in that time. Not all churches, but he said some churches would be doing this. What is that? Okay, turn that off. Where was I at? Okay, here we go. Um, preach the word in season, out of season. You reprove. See, part of the job of the word of God as you're bringing for doctrine in the church is to reprove. Now, how many like being reproved? I don't like being reproved. Do you like being reproved? But being reproved, is it necessary? Let me ask you, how many parents are in this building this morning? How many have reproved your children? Yeah. Do you like doing that? No. What you want is children that are just completely compliant and obedient, don't you? Uh, you want the child to come out of the womb and just, you know, have a smile on his face and never cry. In fact, when it gets old enough to communicate, you want it to be able to raise his hand and say, Mom, hey, listen, I've got a little thing going on here. Uh, my diaper's full. But when you get a chance, hey, no hurry. Uh, could you take care of this? Or, by the way, I'm getting a little hungry, and I know you're busy, and I know you've got other things to do, but when you get around to it, w would you please feed me? And then when you get into the nursery and they're sharing toys with each other, oh, I've had that one for a while, let me let you have that. And, and by the way, I'll take that one back, and we'll share. Wouldn't you love that? And when they become teenagers... Wouldn't you just love it if they would come to you and say, Mom and Dad, I want to be absolutely obedient. Now, what are the rules? Because I'm going to keep them. And... Uh, Yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Uh, is, is that your experience? No, your experience is you do what I say. Why? I'll kill you if you don't. <laughs> That's kind of, especially when they become teenagers. You know, I was just talking to somebody recently, and I said, listen, you know, the Bible in Galatians says the law was our schoolmaster. Uh, it fenced us in until grace came. And I think sometimes with our kids, the law has to be the fence until they finally come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and are under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit and they're filled with God's grace and His Spirit. And, and then you can trust them. But listen, there, are, there is reproof that is necessary. I need to be reproved. You need to reprove. The Word of God reproves us. And that's what Paul is saying here. Listen, it is profitable for reproof for rebuke, when you're reproved, the idea is to be corrected, and you don't follow that correction, then rebuke should come by the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God. You should be rebuked, and then you should be exhorted, challenged, and charged to live in a certain way with all long suffering and doctrine. And then he tells us, for the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. I think we're there. Would you agree? Um, because it's hard to be reproved and rebuked and exhorted with all long suffering and doctrine. It's hard to be challenged. But listen, Bible doctrine is profitable for correction and reproof and instruction in righteousness. Because he tells us there's a time coming when men will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap themselves teachers. And they're out there. 
They'll tell you what you want to hear. They'll tell you it's okay to have relationships with your girlfriend or boyfriend before you're married because God knows your heart. I've had them in my office from other churches to do premarital counseling because most other churches charge you for that. We don't. And I've had them in my office and they said, well, God knows our heart. And I said, you're absolutely right. Your heart is desperately wicked. That's what Jeremiah 17 says. Thus God regenerated you and washed you in the Holy Spirit. He put that spirit in you and he gave you his word. And he wants to be the master of your life. And so the word of God, it reproves and it rebukes and it instructs and it exhorts with all long suffering and doctrine. But the time will come when they'll have teachers and they'll heap them with itching ears. And it says this, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. I don't know about you, but why even go to church if you're not wanting to hear the truth? Why waste your time on a Sunday morning to go to a place where you don't hear the truth? I mean, why do that? Don't you want to hear the truth? Don't you want to hear about God's grace and His mercy and His forgiveness? Don't you want to hear about justification and all the promises that come with having faith in Christ? Don't you want to hear about sanctification, how that the Holy Spirit can come in you and upon you and teach you how to possess your vessel in honor, pleasing unto the Lord in sanctification? How to put off the old man and put on the new man and walk in newness of life in that place where God's hand of blessing can be upon you? Don't you want to hear that? I remember I couldn't get enough of it when I got saved. I read my Bible every morning. I'd get up early. I'd take it to, and put it in my lunch pail. And at lunch, I'd read my Bible. At night, I would spend hours reading my Bible. I looked for church services. And if the church that I was attending didn't have something going on that night, I found some other Bible study, some guy's group or something, some teenagers getting together, some house thing. and Because and I, I love to hear God's word. Lord put something in me that cooked in me to want to hear what he had to say and then to be obedient to it. May God breathe again as he did in the early church that breath of life into that church and then the fire of sanctification because once that took place, once those people were drawn to that place of salvation and God breathed into them the breath of life and the fire of sanctification began to dance upon their heads as we saw earlier in this chapter, there was something that was placed deep inside of them and that was a hunger to know God and to know his word, to study it that they might be a workman who need not to be ashamed, who could rightly divide the word of truth, who could walk in obedience. And Paul is telling us that all scripture, all graphic written word is inspired of God and it is profitable for doctrine because it will correct and reprove and exhort with all long suffering. But be careful because the time will come and I think it's here when men will not endure sound doctrine. We're seeing churches today that are accepting homosexuality is something other than sin. And I'm not saying that God doesn't love homosexuals. He does. God loves drug abusers. He loves drunks. He loves liars and murderers. For God so loved the world. But he calls us out of the world. Come out from among it and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing and I'll be your God and you'll be my people and I'll put my hand of blessing upon you. How do we know that from his word? We're called out to a sanctified and separated life to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. How do we know we're supposed to do that? Because the scripture tells us. The scripture tells us that the weapons to do that of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of the strongholds. Thus we need to ask and wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells us that. How do we know that if we resist the devil, he has to leave? Because the Bible tells us that. How do we know how to walk and act and live? Because the Bible tells us that. Thus, it is so important that we lay down firm and solid doctrine. You know, again, I, I was in Philadelphia helping start a church there, and you know that the scene, and 
I walked out of a building. We're taking the youth to go see uh, Independence Hall to kind of do the tour there where our founding fathers drafted, uh, you know, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the, you know, the Declaration of Independence. And as we're going there, we walk out and I'm caught up in this parade and I'm looking around because I can see the TV cameras there and there was helicopters above and, you know, I could, I, you know, there's a big crowd over here in this grass area by Independence Hall and, and we're headed to where the, the Liberty Bell was, was stored there and, and I'm looking around and I look over to my right and I, there's a gal there in a purple uh, priestly robe with a backwards collar and she had in her hand a rainbow flag and I knew right then where I was at. And I'm looking up and I'm thinking, and, and Pastor Rick was with me. You know, Pastor Rick, he's like six foot five, six foot six, and about 350 pounds. You, you can't mistake him. And I'm thinking, we're going to be on the six o'clock news. And before I can get back to the church, they're going to say, what in the world and why in the world were you there? And so I'm, I'm working my way out of this parade, and I look over to my left, and there's two little ladies with a booth there. And they have a banner in front of the booth that says, God hates gays. And so I walk over there and I said, listen, ladies, hey, sisters, uh, that's not true. Not true. Well, yes, he does. I said, no, he does not. He doesn't hate homosexuals. He doesn't hate gay people. He hates their sin just like he hates my sin and your sin because our sin separates us from fellowship with him. How do we know that? From the Bible. I said, you have the wrong message. The message should be God loves you, but he's calling you to repentance because he has a better way for you to live. That you can enjoy his peace and his presence. And so when I got done speaking to those two ladies, as I'm walking away, this gal runs over to me and says, I hope you gave it to him. I said, I am one of them. She goes, what? I said, I'm a Christian, but they have the wrong message. She goes, you, you don't believe that God hates gays? I said, no, are, are, you, are you, I don't know what word I should use because I'm having this, I'm looking right in her eye. I said, should I use gay? She goes, gay's a good word. And I said, are you gay? She goes, yes, I am. I said, okay, God loves you. Well, how can you say that? No other Christian says that. And I said, well, then they're wrong if they don't. God loves you. I'm going to tell you how much God loves you. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. That you could be brought back into fellowship with him. That he could cleanse you and take those things from you. Well, I don't believe the Bible. And I said, well, it doesn't matter if you believe the Bible or not. You can go stand up on Independence Hall at the bell tower and jump off and all the way down to the ground and yell, I don't believe in gravity. <laughs> but you're going to hit the ground and splat. So it doesn't matter if you believe it or not, it's still true. She goes, well, I was born this way. And I said, I agree with you. She goes, you agree with me that I was born this way? No Christian ever says that. And I said, well, listen, you were conceived in sin and born in transgression. Pick your poison. I was an amoral, drug-abusing hippie. That was my poison. Maybe your poison is different. But we're all conceived in sin and born in transgression. We don't have to stay that way. We don't have to stay that way. And then I shared my testimony with her. Listen, if I would have met you, because I was so homophobic, if I would have met you before I was saved, we wouldn't have got along. I said, have I been kind to you? She said, oh, you've been very kind. Have in any way I been in any way, intolerant of you. No, you haven't. I said, but what you're asking of me is not tolerance. What you're asking is acceptance. And I can't give you acceptance just like I couldn't give myself acceptance for how I was living. Because finally when the Holy Spirit convicted me, because by the way, Jesus, after he died on the cross, sent the Holy Spirit to convict men of sin and of righteousness and of the judgment that come. I said, let me tell you, your, your parade here is because you're convicted and you're trying to convince everybody that you're right but you never will because you know in your heart what you're doing is wrong just like I knew 
Sleeping with all those girls before I was married was wrong. Just like I knew drug abuse and alcoholism before I was saved was wrong. The Holy Spirit was convicting me. Now, I tried to convince people that it was right, but I knew that it was wrong. Well, how did you know? I said, I began to read the Bible. She goes, you read the Bible? I said, I read the Bible before I was saved. It made me mad. I'd throw the thing up against the wall. It would sit there for weeks at a time. Then I'd go pick it up and read it again. She goes, why did it make you mad? I said, because it acted like it had the right to tell me how to live. And I come to find out it did. And it does. Because all graphy, written word, is inspired of God. It's God-breathed, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the people who want to serve God would be perfectly, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So you trust the Bible. Absolutely. I don't trust me. And you shouldn't trust you. Because we got ourselves in this mess trusting us. But God has a better way. You know, I saw tears starting to form in her eyes. Because I said, if I had time, I would tell you that the divorce rate among homosexuals is much higher than heterosexuals. Disease and suicide is higher. It's not right. And besides, if everybody believed the way you did, the human race would end. So it's not right. And I'm not here to judge you, but I am here to tell you there's a way out. And God has a way for you. But you have to be willing to surrender your life to Him, just like I did. And I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy. She had tears in her eyes. She said, you know, you give me a lot to think about. But you're not like any other Christian that I've ever encountered because other Christians don't study the Bible. God tells me that he loves the whole world. He died for the whole world. He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. I don't know about you, but I qualified. How many were sick when Jesus found you? Hey, you can pick your poison. Don't be so judgmental. Don't judge the drug abuser or the alcoholic. Don't judge the murderer or the thief or the homosexual. Because listen, we all had our manner of life in times past. Would you say amen? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, pride, we all had it. But God redeemed us from that. How do we know that? Doctrine. We study the Bible to know what God has to say. But the time will come when men won't do that. And they'll just say, hey, listen, just love one another and it's okay. Uh, just walk, live any way you want, and that's right. It's not. But then he tells here, Paul telling Timothy, but watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. I like that he says that because truth is the new hate language today. Did you notice that? And if you speak the truth, you're going to be afflicted. But always speak it in love. Now, you can speak the truth in such a way that you should be afflicted. <laughs> yeah, don't beat people with the Bible, but love them with the word of God. Do the work of an evangelist. We all should be doing that, sharing the gospel. Make full proof of your ministry. What is Paul saying doctrine is important? In fact, Titus, another one of the pastoral epistles in Titus 1, 9 says, holding fast the faithful words as he have been taught, holding fast uh, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the unbeliever. Just like me talking with that gal. You know, man, my heart went out to her because I knew what it was like being in bondage to sin. I knew what it was like having that shame basedness and that guilt and trying to convince other people that what you were doing was okay and even trying to convince yourself and deceive yourself. I remember being in that dark place and I could see it in her. And my heart went out to her. And my heart went out to her to the fact that there's people over here representing the Christ that I serve saying that God hates them when he doesn't. I felt an obligation to spend that time with her. And, you know, and the crowd the, of the people moved on, and finally I caught up with them at Independence Hall. But I wanted that gal to know that Jesus Christ loves her. He died for her. He could change her from the inside out. He could give her newness of life. He could give her hope and peace like he did me. That's why we hold fast the faithful words that we've been taught that we might be able through sound doctrine to exhort and to convince the unbeliever there's a better way. Amen? 
Titus goes on to say in chapter 2, verse 1, but speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. I could look that lady in the eye and I could tell her because I'm convinced that God's word is inerrant and inspired and I understand the doctrinal premises of it and I could share with her, listen, God will forgive you. He'll put his spirit in you. He'll change your life. The peace you're looking for, you'll find in him. You'll not find it in what you're doing. And you can have every rally you want, and, and you're going to try to convince people that what you're doing is okay, but you know yourself it's not. You know when you go to bed, you still have to go to bed with you, and it's not. So through the words of Christ, because the Bible says God's word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and when you speak it, it goes right down into the heart. And she knew what I was saying was to be the truth. That's why the tears began to well up. And I'm trying to tell you there's a better way. There is a better way for you, sister. And it ain't this. Titus 2.7 says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. You see, I could look her in the eye and call her to repentance because I believe it. I'm not going to skirt around the issue. Because I know that her only hope is Jesus Christ. I know her only hope is to repent and ask Jesus Christ to become the Lord of her life. Fill her with the Spirit. Put that joy and peace in her life. I know without that, she's going to go through this life miserable and guilt-ridden and shame-based. And ultimately, the suicide rate among homosexuals is so high, there's a great possibility the lady I'm talking to won't make it into her early 20s. I love that girl. I still pray for her. I don't, maybe when I get to heaven, I'll see her. I don't know. But I know I can challenge her on that because I believe what God has to say. I believe what he has to say with all of my heart, that he calls us to repentance because he has a better way for us. And I'm not going to corrupt that. I'm going to speak it with all gravity and with all sincerity. Doctrine. That was the first thing that we find in the early church. The most important thing, the thing that was paramount was teaching and instruction to report accurately and thoroughly what the prophets and what the apostles had taught. The second thing that we see there is fellowship. And, and I want you to write this down. The word there in the Greek is koinonia. And it simply means to have all things common, to share all things, and to bear all things. Because the Bible teaches us, listen, that we're not in this alone. The Bible teaches us that we are to walk in faith and in unity, that I'm to love you like I love myself. In fact, I'm to prefer you more than I prefer myself. And that's the kind of fellowship that the body of Christ is supposed to have. I have your back, you have mine. I'm going to hold you accountable, you're going to hold me accountable. I'm going to pray for you, you're going to pray for me. I'm going to love you no matter what, unconditionally, you love me unconditionally. I'm going to speak the truth to you in love, and you're going to speak the truth to me in love. That's what the body of Christ is to look like. Romans chapter 12, verses 15 and 16 say this. Listen carefully. Rejoice with them that rejoice. I can't tell you how many times I've been taken out to the parking lot and one of you guys got a new car and I get to look at it. Oh, man, that's good. God blessed you. You finally made it. You own a Toyota. <laughs> good for you. Amen. Or a Mustang. Man, I am so happy for you. Or to find out you got a house finally, like Todd and Ann Lynn. I got to see on Facebook last night that they built their first fire in their new home. And I was just praying, Lord, may the Spirit of the living God warm that place. May that not just be a house, may it be a home. I'm so happy for them. And when babies come along, I don't just rejoice, I weep because you have no clue. <laughs> when the first one shows up, you have no clue. You rejoice with those who rejoice. You weep with those who weep. Watch this. Be of the same mind toward one another. As you would have people treat you, you treat them. It's fellowship. It's kononia. In fact, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says this. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Um, you know, you're not heavy. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? You're my brother. You're not heavy. You're my sister. And there's something God does 
in our hearts. That fruit of the Spirit, that love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, self-control. When the Holy Spirit enters us, it it changes us. I, I was a very hateful, angry man before I got saved. Very bitter, very critical, very judgmental. But when the Holy Spirit came in, He began to work on that. To the degree and to the extent that I could stand in Philadelphia, there at Independence Hall, and look a lady in the eye who could not be more the polar opposite of who I am. And God put in my heart love and compassion for her. And share straightforwardly and lovingly without any corruptness, the gravity and sincerity of the truth. I pray that one day those words would so penetrate her heart it would bring salvation like they did for me. Bear you one another's burdens, so fulfill, fulfill the law of Christ. So the second thing we saw cooking in the church was this having all things common, this fellowship, this accountability, this unity, this love, this acceptance. And I, listen, and I want to tell you right now, I don't care how you come into this church. Uh, I don't care how messed up you are. In fact, man, listen, when I walked into the church, the first Sunday I, I, after the Bible said I went to church, you know, I put on my best clothes. I didn't even wear tie-dye. I wore a, I remember the day I wore a green T-shirt with a pocket, and to me that was a dress shirt. Listen, I didn't even wear my Levi's that my grandmother had embroidered. I had a really cool bell bottom. She had opened up the thing with some psychedelic kind of material and I had these giant bell bottoms that were embroidered can you imagine (laughs) I didn't even wear those I wore a pair of corduroys brown that matched the green I thought green and brown don't they they go together I didn't even wear my flip flop sandals I looked at my Birkenstocks as far as I'm concerned from flip flops to Birkenstocks that's from casual to dress I didn't even wear those I had some floaters how many know what floaters are if you don't know my generation, you don't. I had floaters. They're kind of like a leather kind of a shoe. And I had a, that Bible that I kept throwing up against the wall. It was white and about this big. And when I walked into that church, there was a guy who was an usher in a three-piece suit, a silk suit. And he said to me, son, if you can't dress any better than that, you ought not to be here. I said, I'm here to see Jesus if he can be found in this place. Later, that guy wanted me to marry his daughter. Can you believe it? But acceptance. I was born again. I was a new creature in Christ. Man, rough around the edges, no doubt. But God had saved me. And I knew that I needed to be a part of a church that could hold me accountable. I need to be some place where I could hear the word. And I pushed that guy aside and went there and sat down. Hey, you know, years later, after Bible college, I became on staff in that church. He wanted me to marry his daughter. He brought me up to the house, had rigatoni, brought Papa Lardo to come and prophesy over me. And I told him, no thanks. Can I get some rigatoni to go? Because I ain't coming back. <laughs> Conania, breaking bread. The third thing we see here, that's the communion table. That's the Lord's table. And this is what Paul says about the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25. He says this, For I received the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you. This is from the Lord. And I'm telling you what the Lord said, Paul is saying. That the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And it says that when he had given thanks, he broke that bread. And he said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He did the same thing with the cup. In like manner, he also took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, he said, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. New covenant. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The third thing that the church is remember what Jesus Christ had done for them. And in that sacrifice, you understand that God loved you so much, for no greater love hath any man than he lay down his life for a friend, that he loves you. 
He loved the world so much he was willing to come and lay down his life for the world. He loves us. But through that sacrifice, we get forgiveness, the blood of Christ. We get cleansed. We get washed. We get forgiven. Through his sacrifice, we remember that. We remember that we're forgiven. How many need forgiveness? You know what I found as a Christian, even as a Christian, how many blew it today? Hey, don't raise your hand, Gary. Listen, how many, like, you know, you get into it with your wife on the way to church. You know what I'm talking about. That's why you're sitting here with your arm around her. I see over there. <laughs> because you know that if you got to get it right in church, where it's like neutral ground, because when you get out of here, it might be some trouble. Listen, we all mess up. And we need his forgiveness, and we need to be reminded it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but because God is merciful, he saved us. We're reminded of that at the communion table, that it was by the blood of Jesus Christ that we've been forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. The fourth thing is prayer. The Greek word for prayer there is interesting. The word he uses here, it's um, prosuki in the Greek, but it doesn't just mean prayer. It goes beyond prayer. Uh, the idea of that Greek word is this public oratory prayer and worship. How many were here Wednesday night? That was prayer because there was worship involved. You were singing to the Lord. You were raising your hands in surrender. That's part of it. You were communing with the Lord during the time of worship. You were praying. And then afterwards, we were praying for you and you were praying for others. The effectual fervent prayer of righteous men avails much. If there's any sick or afflicted among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them lay hands on them and pray for them and anoint them with oil. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And if they've committed any sin, it would be forgiven them. Praying always with all prayer and supplication for all of the saints. That's prayer. And we have a beautiful picture of this in Nehemiah. I also had somebody tell me again, you know, we don't have any proof text of what a service should look like. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you that those five things should be involved in a church, but we go back to Nehemiah, and here we have a service. You know the story. You know the scene. You know that the nation of Israel, because of this sin, was led away into captivity for 70 years. Now they're coming back out of that captivity. Ezra and Joshua and Zerubbabel have gone back and built the temple, but the walls are broken down. Nehemiah hears of it from his brother and asks the Lord to use him. And he goes back to Jerusalem and he builds the walls. And when the walls and the temple are done, then this is what took place. Listen carefully. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all of the people. Because he was above the people, kind of like this this morning. He opens the book, you're there, he's here. And when the book was opened, all the people stood up in reverence. You think that they put high value on the word of God and doctrine? They stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God of heaven, and all the people answered, even the timid ones, amen and amen, that's true, that's right, so be it, so be it. God, you're true, you're right. They responded, and then with the lifting of hands. Some would say, don't lift hands in church. It makes me uncomfortable. Let me ask you this. If you walk out of here and you're at the 7-Eleven or if you're down here at, at the Chevron gas station and a guy walks in with a gun and puts a square in your back, what's the first thing you're going to do? Yeah. It's a universal sign of what? Surrender. Surrender. Why do you think we raise hands in church? Lord, I, I surrender. Uh, not my, my will anymore, not my ways, your ways. Do you know where that came from? It came from the dark ages when a knight would encounter another knight. And with his right hand, he would raise it to show he had no weapon in it. But then the knights were sneaky because they'd have another hand. Not their right hand, but their left hand. Some were left-handed. So they had to raise both hands. I'm not here fight with you. I'm not here to do battle with you. It later became known as a salute. When a soldier salutes another soldier, what he's saying is, is I'm honoring you. I ha Listen, I'm not wanting to have a battle with you. I'm totally respectful, respectful of you. I salute you. And so when we come to church in a very tangible way, we can raise our hands 
and respect and surrender to the Lord. And then it says, and they bowed their heads. That's a sign of humility. And they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then verse 8 says, and so they read in the book of the law distinctly, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, like we're doing this morning. And then the priest gave the sense and caused the people to understand. That's a church service. That's prayer. That's a worship service. And so when he's talking about prayer, it's not just prayer, it's worship and prayer and and respectfully listening and preparing your heart to hear the word of God. So we see doctrine, fellowship. Didascalia, kononia. Prayer, suki. Breaking of bread, remembrance. But the last one is fear. And I think this is what the church has lost. This is what I pray for in my life every day. Because it says, and fear came upon, verse 43, every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says this, and I'll put it up on the board. Because the Greek word for this is phobos. We get almost as a direct transliteration into the English, phobia. Um, you remember back in your, um, well, don't remember back, but back in the days when you weren't living right and you were traveling down the highway under the influence, not of the Holy Spirit, and don't, you know, and, and you were paranoid. In fact, your friends would say, man, you're paranoid. Of course I'm paranoid. I'm doing what I'm not supposed to be doing, and I'm waiting any moment for the lights to start going red and, and, and blue. And I remember one night, I, I, can, can I share this? BC days, before Christ, my girlfriend is sitting next to me, my friend is sitting on the other side, and we are stoned out of our heads. And we're driving. And I'm trying to keep it between the, you know, the two lines. And all of a sudden, the whole back part of the car lights up blue and red. Oh, man, we're busted. <laughs> and I, I pull over. And that police officer comes to the door and he said, uh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> and he goes, well, you're swerving all over the road. That's my girlfriend's fault. And he looks at her and says, you need to scoot over some. And he let me go. <laughs> and I want to tell you fear. My heart was pounding because I was busted because that man had the power to take me to jail impound my car arrest my girlfriend which his father would come down to the jail and do me bodily harm (laughs) there was phobia going on there another time same situation lights come on God has a sense of humor and so I tell my friend, Mike Kropatnik, look at the glove box. There's a, there's a bottle of cologne in there. This time it was his girlfriend. I drank some, she drank some, he drank some to get rid of the smell off our breath. We pull over. The cop car goes around us. <laughs> and for the next hour, we're throwing up our toenails in this guy's front yard. <laughs> Do not drink cologne. So loudly were we throwing up that the neighbor, I mean, the the person who owned the house came out and said, are you guys okay? (laughs) Phobia. Listen, the word means to stand in awe, to be terrified of and overwhelmed by. Because God is watching and God sees He loves you, but he's also a God that disciplines. He disciplines those that are his, and he disciplines those that he loves. And here's what we read in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and then we'll tie it on in our thoughts. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but the fool despises wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord has this idea that God owns your heart and that you own him in such a way that you stand in awe of him. You've not lost the awe of God. And so the early church had these five things impressed, if you will, branded upon their DNA. Uh, They were a church of the word. They were men and women of the word. 
They studied to show themselves approved of God, workmen who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. The word of God had high value and a great place of standing in their fellowships. They taught it verse by verse. When the letters were circulated, they read them. They were in the word. Secondly, they held each other accountable. There was this unity. There was this commonness. They were bearing one another burdens and and speaking the truth and love to one another. There was this intense fellowship. And, And then they broke bread at the Lord's table to remind themselves, this is what Jesus did for us. This is what God the Father did in sending His Son for us. Let us never forget the cost of our salvation and the great forgiveness that's been purchased for us by the blood of Christ. And let's pray. Let's worship Let's raise our hands and surrender. Let's bow our heads in humility. Let's honor the great God of heaven. Let's honor his word. Let's pray for one another, prayer and worship. But then the fear, the awe of God. It permeated their fellowship. It permeated their heart. And because of that, and I've had people ask me, why don't we see the miracles today as we saw back in the first century? Is God different today than he was back there? No, the church is different. If the church would get back to teaching God's word with the expectation and aspiration to be obedient to it. If there was this fellowship instead of bickering and backbiting and slander, if there was this immense fellowship and holding one another accountable. Brother, what do you think? And sister, what do you think? And don't do that. But do this. Let me help you. Fellowship. Breaking of bread at the Lord's table. Remembering him prayer fear all and then it says in verse 44 i'll just read these for a few verses as we close out this chapter and all that believed were together and had all things common and they sold their possessions and their goods and they parted them to all men every man has a need because they're staying now in jerusalem they're not going home and they need a place to stay. They need something to eat. So people that had things were selling them and so that they could stay there and listen from the apostles what God was doing. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple. That is in the temple precincts where the word of God was taught publicly. And they were breaking bread and having home Bible studies from house to house. And they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Underline that singleness of heart because this section starts with that same idea. When you go back to verse 41, it says, and then they gladly received the word of God, were baptized, uh, about 3,000 souls. And then verse 42 says this, and they continued steadfastly. That verb in the Greek for steadfastly means this, a single-minded fidelity and commitment to a certain course of action. A single-minded fidelity and commitment to a certain course of action. What was the course of action? Study God's word, be in fellowship, communion table, prayer, fear of God. That's our course of action. And with single-mindedness, of singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, we get into chapter 3, we're going to see that They're going to prayer, and by faith they heal this guy. And another great group of people come to faith. But then persecution always follows, doesn't it? So the five things we see this morning, let's let's just take a look at them one more time, write them down, that I think was the very foundation of the early church and should be the foundation of the church today. It should be the teaching of God's word, would you agree? How do we do that distinctly? Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, book by book. Amen? Amen. Fellowship. You should be bearing one another's burdens and praying for one another. You should be uplifting and challenging one another. You should be interacting with one another. You should be holding each other accountable and praying for each other. Would you agree? Well, how about remembering what the Lord's done for you? Why do you think I'm having a hymn saying at every end of the worship service because those hymns remind us, every one of them, of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Worship and prayer. But all of that, all of those first four things are in the context of a heart that fears God, that stands in awe of Him. 
If you lose the awe of God, the rest of it goes away. We stand in awe of Him. The one who saved us, redeemed us, washed us and cleansed us, gave us hope and peace. Amen? We stand in awe. So let's stand. Worship team, will you come? I love that section. I might say it's one of my favorite. Just understanding what it is that the church should be about. It is the blueprint, is it not? Is it not? Well, let's see. I told these guys we didn't know what we were going to do. So let's sing the hymn that we closed last service with, last Sunday, before the throne of God. Listen to the words, would you? Listen to what God has done for you. Because you might be here this morning thinking that you're unredeemable. Nobody's unredeemable. Nobody. You might be here this morning thinking that, man, I've messed up so much, God can't love me. Listen, God loves everyone. And if you're making a full-on effort to serve Him, He loves you all the more. Amen? Well, I can't be perfect. You're absolutely right. You can't. But there is one who can declare you to be and present you as though you were before the throne of God. And that's what this song sings. And it says, and we sing it, amen? Let's do it. One of these days we'll be there. I hope soon. Before the throne Christ.
Father, may that truth just penetrate our hearts, especially the part where when Satan comes to tempt us to despair. May we look up and see you standing there. Oh, Father, we thank you for that great assurance this morning that our names are graven upon your hand, they're written upon your heart. And when God the Father looked at you, he pardoned us. Oh, man, did I ever need a pardon. Lord, you didn't parole us. Some think that that's what they're on and they got to be really good. Otherwise, they go back to jail. You didn't parole us. You pardoned us. You set us free. You forgave us. And so, Lord, May that sink in. We only know that from the study of your word, from doctrine. And because of that, we have fellowship with you and one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, as we honor the communion table, we know has cleansed us of all of our sins. Thus we worship and we pray and we stand in awe of you. Oh, Father, may that be the reality that your Holy Spirit brings to your church. We pray it in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's sons and daughters would say, amen, amen. amen. Hey, if you need special prayer, we'll be up here to pray with you and for you. If not, hey, you're dismissed to fellowship this morning.